ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Mr. Christopher Ray. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you all for coming this evening. In honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, if you'd please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get started this evening, there's just a few people in the audience I'd like to make sure I recognize. Uh, Ventura County District Attorney Eric Nasarenko. Eric? <laughs> and Ventura County Sheriff Bill Ayub. Bill? <laughs> and of course, we want to thank all of the former and current FBI agents and law enforcement agents here this evening. Thank you for joining us. You are all here tonight for a first in our foundation's history. This is the very first time we have welcomed the sitting director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to the Reagan Library. It's also the first time we have had an audience so well behaved. <laughs> director Ray is here tonight in part to celebrate our first of its kind 11,000 square foot exhibit on the history of his storied agency. We have artifacts that the public has never seen before and likely may never see together again. Here's just a few. Some personal effects of the FBI's first director, J. Edgar Hoover the automobile known as Bonnie and Clyde's death car. We have John Dillinger's gun as well. The Unabomber's manifesto. A raft used by three prisoners to escape Alcatraz, or did they? An engine from one of the aircraft that terrorists used to destroy the World Trade Center on 9-11. The FBI history, its history, fascinates so many. Its predecessor organization, founded by Teddy Roosevelt's first attorney general, Charles Bonaparte. Yes, those Bonapartes. He was the grandnephew of the Emperor Napoleon. So a lot to explore in this exhibit, and I hope that you will pay it a visit if you haven't had the chance already. Importantly, we could not have put this exhibition together without the help of the FBI, both at its LA main office and headquarters in Washington, DC. Tonight, though, with Director Ray, I know that we will move beyond the past and continue the journey into the threats the FBI is confronting today and tomorrow. By the director's own count, the FBI is investigating 100 different types of ransomware. It's opening a new China counterintelligence investigation every 10 hours. It has arrested more than 600 gang members in a single month. And thousands of tips pour into the Bureau's National Threat Operations Center every day. This is an agency whose adversaries seem to shapeshift by the day. So it takes a seasoned professional 
to lead its mission. In Christopher Ray, they have one. Now, if we were to prepare an exhibit on Director Ray's career, 2001 would be a key moment when he moved from being an assistant U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Georgia to the role of Associate Deputy Attorney General at the Justice Department shortly before the 9-11 attacks. In the tick-tock of that fateful day, you'd see he spent the afternoon at the FBI in the Strategic Information and Operations Center with Director Mueller and Attorney General John Ashcroft. This Ray exhibit might include highlights from his time as the youngest assistant attorney general leading the DOJ's criminal division where he prosecuted names like Enron. You'd find the Edmund J. Randolph Award, the DOJ's highest honor for leadership in public service, which he received in 2005, a testament to his character and dedication. And I imagine you might also see a photo or two of his days at Yale, an especially meaningful place, as that's where he met his wife, Helen. Yet, as full as his career has been, I'd wager the most compelling parts of his biography are yet to be written, because there are too many threats to confront, too many enemies to defeat, and too many cases to solve for the next chapter of his life to be anything less than riveting. Ladies and gentlemen, for a truly special evening here at the Reagan Library, please welcome the eighth, yes, only the eighth, director of the FBI, Christopher Wray. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. And I have to say, I'm honored to be here with you at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. The years of President Reagan's administration were momentous ones, defined in large part by our struggle against the Soviet Union, whose empire, where freedoms we hold dear, were snuffed out. And I'm sure everyone here is familiar with President Reagan's speech at the Brandenburg Gate in June 1987 when he called out Mr. Gorbachev by name and challenged him to tear down this wall between free West Berlin and imprisoned East Germany, a nightmare surveillance state where no personal information was off limits to the government. The FBI was deeply engaged in that struggle, tracking Soviet agents operating here in the United States and protecting our freedoms from a dangerous enemy. That era and that work are a huge part of the FBI's legacy and history, a history that the library has captured so well in this exhibit. So I want to take a moment to thank the library and John and the exhibit curators, Randall Swan, Jennifer Torres, Lauren Haish Edwards, Robert Zuka, and Derek Linus for the great care you've taken in telling the FBI's story. Thank you for the tour this afternoon, and thank you for showcasing our organization and our people who I'm proud and humbled to represent. And thank you for allowing me to join you here this evening. I also want to congratulate whoever came up with the name for the exhibit, FBI, from Al Capone to Al Qaeda. <laughs> it's not only catchy, it also captures the way the world has changed since the Bureau's establishment back in 1908, and the way we've evolved as a law enforcement and intelligence agency to keep ahead of the changing threats we face. Today, we in the United States and the Western world find ourselves in a very different struggle against another global adversary, the Chinese Communist Party. Now, there are some surface-level similarities between the threat posed by the Chinese government and the historical threat of the Soviet Union. The Chinese government also rejects the fundamental freedoms, basic human rights, 
and democratic norms we value as Americans. But the Soviet Union didn't make much that anyone in America wanted to buy. We didn't invest in each other's economies or send huge numbers of students to study in each other's universities. The U.S. and today's China are far more interconnected than the U.S. and the old USSR ever were. And China is an economic power on a level the Soviets could never have dreamed of being. The complexity of the threat posed by the Chinese government flows from those new realities. Because China's government has the global reach and presence of a great nation, but it refuses to act the part and too often uses its capabilities to steal and threaten rather than to cooperate and build. And that theft, those threats, are happening right here in America literally every day. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight, the threat posed by the Chinese government here at home to our economic security and to our freedoms, our freedom of speech, of conscience, our freedom to elect and be served by our representatives without foreign meddling, our freedom to prosper when we toil and invent. I've spoken a lot about this threat since I became FBI director, but I want to focus on it here tonight because in many ways it's reached a new level, more brazen, more damaging than ever before. And it's vital, vital that all of us focus on that threat together. Now, having said that, I do want to be clear that the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party pose the threat we're focused on countering not the Chinese people and certainly not Chinese Americans who are themselves frequently victims of the Chinese government's lawless aggression. Protecting them from the Chinese government is top of mind for us too. America is richer and stronger because of the generations of people who immigrated here from China, many of whom will celebrate the traditional Lunar New Year festival this week. At the FBI, we're committed to protecting the safety and rights of all Americans. At the Bureau, we've long held the view that protecting our nation's innovation is both a law enforcement priority and a top national security priority. It secures national prosperity and security, but it also keeps individual workers employed, families able to make ends meet and fully live their lives, to put food on the table. That's what's really at stake in the fight with the Chinese government here in America. It's home economics, not just macroeconomics. America's strength is built on our innovation, on our striving citizens and the world changing products and services they build. From the invention of the airplane back around the time of the FBI's founding, to the computer, the internet, GPS, life-saving medicines, and thousands of others over the decades. When we tally up what we see in our investigations, over 2,000 of which are focused on the Chinese government trying to steal our information and technology, there is just no country that presents a broader threat to our ideas, our innovation, and our economic security than China. The Chinese government steals staggering volumes of information and causes deep job-destroying damage across a wide range of industries. So much so that, as you heard, we're constantly opening new cases to counter their intelligence operations, about every 12 hours or so. What makes the Chinese government's strategy so insidious is the way it exploits multiple avenues at once, often in seemingly innocuous ways. They identify key technologies to target. Their Made in China 2025 plan, for example, lists 10 broad ones, the keys to economic success in the coming century, spanning industries like robotics, green energy production and vehicles, aerospace, biopharma, and so on. And then, and then they throw every tool in their arsenal at stealing that technology to succeed in those areas. 
Here in the US, they unleash a massive, sophisticated hacking program that is bigger than those of every other major nation combined. Operating from pretty much every major city in China with a lot of funding and sophisticated tools and often joining forces with cyber criminals, in effect, cyber mercenaries. In just one case, one example, a group of MSS-associated criminal hackers stole terabytes of data from hundreds of companies. Now, to put that in context, one terabyte is around 70 million pages of data. Think about that. They're not just hacking on a huge scale, but causing indiscriminate damage to get what they want, like in the recent Microsoft Exchange hack, which compromised the networks of more than 10,000 American companies in a single campaign alone. At the same time, the Chinese government uses intelligence officers to target the same information, multiplying their efforts by working extensively through scores of so-called co-optees, basically people who aren't technically Chinese government officials, but who assist in their intelligence operations, spotting and assessing sources, providing cover, communications, and helping steal secrets in other ways. The Chinese government also makes investments and partnerships to position their proxies to take valuable technology. Sometimes they just wave enough money to get what they want, but often they also conceal which companies they actually control or use companies they don't literally own, but instead can control through embedded Chinese Communist Party cells that are required to exist in virtually any Chinese company of any real size. Using elaborate shell games to disguise their efforts, both from our companies and from our government investment screening program, CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Within China, they force U.S. companies to partner with Chinese government-owned ones to do business in China and then abuse and exploit those partnerships. A recent case from Ohio is a great illustration of the Chinese government's multi-pronged strategy for stealing our valuable secrets. This past November, a Chinese intelligence officer named Xu Yanjun was convicted of economic espionage in Cincinnati. He was part of the Chinese Ministry of State Security, which is one of their spy services, and he was in a unit responsible for stealing aviation-related secrets. Xu was targeting an advanced engine made by GE and a foreign joint venture partner, an engine that Chinese state-owned enterprises were openly working to copy. He corrupted insiders with access to sensitive company data and access to company IT infrastructure so Xu could help MSS hackers in cyber units back in China target the same data at the same time. Xu used one of his recruits or co-optees, this one a senior company IT official, to help him plant malware on a joint venture company laptop. He kept in touch with the MSS hackers in China to make sure that they could access the implant that he'd uploaded. And then, to steal a particular composite fan blade technology that only GE possesses, he used another co-optee, this one an official at a prominent Chinese university, to contact a GE engineer through LinkedIn. Now, as an aside, I would be remiss if I didn't note that we see an awful lot of Chinese intelligence outreach on social media, especially on LinkedIn. So they offered this engineer a trip to China to give a presentation on his work at a university there, and then another trip to Europe. When we saw what was happening, we and GE were able to use our relationship to work together to foil the attempted threat. Letting the scheme appear to play out, but helping GE provide the engineer altered documents to steal. So in this case, at least, because of GE's quick work and cooperation, China was not able to leapfrog over a decade of hard work and billions in investment to undercut a major U.S. employer with nearly 50,000 employees. But we're waging this battle every day. As dangerous 
as that blend of tools all directed at a single company's technology is, what's really scary is how common Chinese operations like that one have become. Xu is just one Chinese intelligence officer working for an entire unit dedicated solely to stealing aviation-related secrets. And that's just one of those 10 technology areas the Chinese government has prioritized for stealing. Just using cyber means, Chinese government hackers have stolen more of our personal and corporate data than every other nation combined. The harm from the Chinese government's economic espionage isn't just that its companies pull ahead based on illeg illegally gotten technology. While they pull ahead, they push our companies and workers behind. That harm, company failures, job losses, has been building for a decade to the crush that we feel today. It's harm felt across the country in a whole range of industries. I'll give you an example. Several years ago, a Chinese government-owned corporation called Sinovel stole the proprietary source code for controlling wind turbines from a U.S. company in Massachusetts, causing that U.S. company, American Semiconductor, to plummet from being a $1.6 billion company to a $200 million company and from 900 employees to only 300 employees. That's 600 people who lost their livelihoods. And while those people were trying to figure out how to cope with catastrophe, Sinovel was adding insult to injury using the source code they'd stolen to sell wind turbines right here in the United States. In 2015, the Chinese government publicly promised to stop handing hacked U.S. technology to Chinese companies. But their cyber theft program kept going strong. And in the years since, they've hit ever more companies and workers. We've seen small companies developing important medicines ransacked. We've seen big managed service providers remotely managing IT services for thousands of other businesses hacked so the Chinese government could hijack their trusted connections with their customers and hack those companies too. Whatever makes an industry tick, they target. Source code from software companies, testing data and chemical designs from pharma firms, engineering designs from manufacturers, personal data from hospitals, credit bureaus, and banks. They've even sent people to sneak into agribusinesses' fields and dig up advanced seeds out of the ground. The common thread is that they steal the things companies can't afford to lose. So the Chinese government's economic theft campaign is not just unprecedented in its breadth, it's also deeply damaging, undoing the labor, ideas, and investments of decades and leaving lives overturned in its wake. But stealing innovation isn't the only way the Chinese government shows their disregard for the international rule of law. The Chinese government is increasingly targeting people inside the U.S. for personal and political retribution, undercutting the freedoms that our Constitution and laws promise. The kinds of people the Chinese Communist Party tends to go after are not those that a responsible government would make their enemies, refugees, dissidents, and Uyghurs, people with their own ideas who speak or worship as their conscience dictates. One egregious example is a thing called Fox Hunt, which is a program that President Xi Jinping claimed in 2014 was created to stamp out corruption. But in reality, in reality, it targets, captures, and repatriates former Chinese citizens living overseas whom it sees as a political or financial threat. Over the past eight years, the Chinese government has hauled home more than 9,000 people worldwide, bringing them back to China where they can be imprisoned or controlled. And a big reason why it's been so effective is because, much like with its economic espionage, the Chinese government is willing to disregard diplomatic norms and international law when it comes to grabbing those victims. 
To start with, they often issue red notices through Interpol using the international law enforcement community to stop and hold people for extradition. Now, effective use of red notices brings real criminals to justice, but issuing red notices for political purposes is an abuse of the program. Currently, there are hundreds of people on U.S. soil who are on the Chinese government's official fox hunt list and a whole lot more that are not on the official list. And most of the targets are green card holders, naturalized citizens, folks with important rights and protections under U.S. law. But abusing red notices is bad enough. We're seeing the Chinese government resort to blackmail, threats of violence, stalking, and kidnappings. They've actually engaged criminal organizations in the U.S., offering them bounties in hopes of successfully taking targets back to China. China applies incredible pressure on the targets of those efforts, many of whom still have family back in China. Some, unaware that the party was after them, have traveled back to China for a visit only to find themselves suddenly trapped and prevented from leaving. Others who are aware that they're targets. In those cases, the Chinese government has arrested their family members and imprisoned them, effectively holding the relatives hostage until the victim returns to China. Now, at the FBI, we know a lot about criminal tactics after 113 years, and this is right up there. And it's certainly not the kind of conduct you would expect from a responsible nation on the world stage. As with the GE economic espionage example, maybe the most appalling thing about fox hunt is that it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the Chinese government's transnational repression. For decades, the Chinese Communist Party has targeted, threatened, and harassed US-based Tibetans and Uyghurs, Falun Gong members, pro-democracy advocates, and really any others who question their legitimacy or authority. Now, of course, there's a lot of bad behavior on the global stage, but the Chinese government's reach, their willingness and ability to exert power here in the United States is unique. Sometimes they seem to make a point of applying overwhelming pressure to stifle even petty criticisms. In 2018, after one U.S.-based employee of a major hotel chain liked a social media post by a Tibetan separatist group, the Chinese government made the U.S. hotel chain shut down all of its Chinese websites and applications for an entire week. And many of you will remember that when an executive with a certain NBA team appeared to tweet in support of Hong Kong democracy protests in 2019, the Chinese government banned NBA broadcasts in China for an entire year. The Chinese government is getting more brazen controlling that kind of speech. In November, just a couple months ago, the Chinese embassy put out letters effectively warning U.S. businesses that if they want to do business in China, they need to fight against Chinese government-related bills in our Congress. But even more concerning are menacing violations of our citizens' and residents' rights. Things like threatening and harassing students at our universities when they exercise their right to free speech. In a recent incident at one Midwestern university, for example, a Chinese-American student posted online praise for those students who were killed in the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. And almost immediately, his parents called from China saying the Chinese intelligence officers had shown up to threaten them because of his post. When the same student participated in an online rehearsal for a protest event with other students, the Chinese government knew what he'd said in the rehearsal, and his parents called again, even more frantic this time. That student backed out of the event, only recently making public what had happened. This is at a major American university, right in the heartland. And that kind of overt harassment is just part of the visible spectrum of the problem. 
the Chinese government is also leveraging covert means, like using their cyber capability to target dissidents. And the party doesn't just go after individuals, though. They aim higher and more broadly to try to corrupt our leaders to buy or intimidate acquiescence to their will. That includes trying to undermine our democratic process by influencing our elected officials. And here, too, they play the long game. The Chinese government understands that politicians in smaller roles today may rise to become more influential over time. So they look to cultivate talent early, often state and local officials, to ensure that politicians at all levels of government will be ready to take a call and advocate on behalf of Beijing's agenda. The Chinese government is not the first with authoritarian ambitions. As I mentioned when we started, President Reagan and his fellow Cold War presidents knew a thing or two about confronting tyranny. But China may be the first government to combine authoritarian ambitions with cutting edge technical capability. It's like the surveillance nightmare of East Germany combined with the tech of Silicon Valley. I hope all this gives you a sense for why the FBI is so focused on the threat from the Chinese government. Here, the Reagan Library's FBI exhibit is a great place to talk about what we, our partners, and our allies are doing about that threat. The exhibit not only shows how threats to the United States have evolved over the decades, but also how the FBI has evolved to stay ahead of those threats. 20 years after 9-11, the FBI is a very different agency in important and valuable ways. To deal with the threat of terrorism, the FBI deployed around the world. We shifted focus to disruption before danger can strike, and we cemented a culture of working with and through partners of all kinds. Today, we use our intelligence collection, both what we develop and what we obtain from partner agencies here and abroad, to identify and disrupt threats early. Like when we ran an operation to slam shut the back doors the Chinese government hackers had placed on thousands of American companies' networks in that Microsoft Exchange operation I was referring to earlier. In that case, working closely with Microsoft and other private sector and government partners. And we focus on sharing what we learn through our work, and I mean really sharing a lot, with a whole variety of partners who can act alongside us. Not just other intelligence services, but law enforcement agencies around the world and private sector, state and local, and military partners here at home pointing to hacking infrastructure to take down, intelligence officers to track, corporate transactions to block, and more. And as we have against other dangers, we're applying a lot of the lessons learned in the fight against terrorism to every aspect of the Chinese government threat. Following the successful model of the Joint Terrorism Task Force as we lead in every one of our field offices, we also now have both cyber and counterintelligence task forces set up in all those field offices too, bringing aboard indispensable teammates from scores of other federal, state, and local agencies. We also recently set up a national counterintelligence task force to provide nationwide coordination with federal law enforcement and intelligence partners, a lot like the National Cyber Joint Investigative Task Force we've built on the cyber side. And we're continuing to adapt how we operate. The post-9-11 counterterrorism analogy is not a perfect one. The biggest differences we see with the threat from the Chinese government are, first, the central importance of the private sector, from young, new economy firms to internet service providers to industrial giants. And second, how often we're using tools other than arrests and prosecutions to neutralize those threats. We're showing that early coordination is essential to achieving positive results, like GE Aviation saving thousands of jobs by acting before their trade secrets could be stolen. 
Much of the battleground that we're contesting lies outside the government's control. Companies whose technology we're helping to protect. Universities whose students and research we're helping to protect. Local governments were warning about foreign threats. None of them are equipped to deal with a threat this complex alone. So it's good they don't have to. We're sharing information those partners need to protect themselves while we employ all the lawful tools at our disposal and provide our government partners around the world with the evidence they need to act in concert. The sheer volume of criminal and threatening actions we see from the Chinese government is immense. But the good news, the good news is that our partners and allies these days are more alert to those dangers than ever. I spend a lot of my time talking with other leaders focused on national security and law enforcement, both here at home and abroad. And the frequency with which this threat dominates the discussion is striking. I have foreign counterparts tell me they're fighting to protect their students from intimidation too. The Chinese officials are targeting their policies and their candidates with malign influence too. That hackers in China are carrying their company's innovation off. That Chinese companies or proxies are using quasi-legal investments to undermine their economies. And they're in the fight with us. Just over the last couple of months, for example, Australia passed new rules to protect students from harassment on campus and to safeguard their universities from research. In the UK, our close partner MI5 publicly alerted the UK Parliament to a Chinese Communist Party agent trying to corrupt their political process. Not long after, my friend and colleague Richard Moore, the head of MI6, warned in his first public speech of some of the very same dangers I've talked about here. Across Europe and East Asia, our partners are establishing or strengthening investment screening programs, toughening cyber defenses, sometimes with our technically trained agents sitting right there with them, and improving their own private sector partnerships. The list goes on. So yes, the Chinese government understands the West's free and open society and tries to exploit it. But the Chinese government's worldview works as a blinder, too. They may think our adherence to the rule of law is a weakness, but they're wrong. As a rule of law agency in a rule of law country, with rule of law partners, we see how our democratic and legal processes arm us. For one, when it's appropriate, we make allegations we can prove to neutral fact finders. And those allegations often give allied governments the predication they need to act. Look at what's been happening with Huawei. When an independent grand jury returns an indictment accusing a company of serial trade secret theft, people think twice about entrusting their privacy and secrets to that company. And the threat Huawei poses is a lot better understood now than it was before our investigation led to those charges. So we're confronting this threat and winning important battles, not just while adhering to our values, but by adhering to our values. I believe that in the course of doing so, we're showing why the Chinese government needs to change course for all our sakes. There is so much good we could do with a responsible Chinese government. Crack down on cyber criminals, stop money launderers, reduce opioid overdose deaths. But at the FBI, we're focused on the reality of the Chinese government today. All of us in America and across the free world are in this together. And as President Reagan said in his inaugural address, no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women.
and I have been heartened to see that recognition take hold, to watch and help our partners gird for the long, important fight now underway. And everyone involved in that fight can be certain that you will have no more committed partner than the FBI. Thank you. Just terrific. Thank you, Director Ray. Just sobering, to be sure. Um, I guess it would be safe to say that China and this kind of theft, the whole broad spectrum of threats that you noted, are the number one priority for the FBI today? Or does the FBI have lots of number one priorities? <laughs> well, uh, I guess I would say this. Um, everywhere I turn, I find that people have really good ideas of things the FBI needs to be doing more of. Uh, I haven't found very many people with really good ideas of what it is we can start doing a lot less of. Um, certainly, for us, counterterrorism is and has to remain our number one priority. But much like most of the intelligence community, there's been a pivot to what we would call the hard targets, which means that a lot of the growth in our national security mission, both counterintelligence and cyber, is really focused on this threat that we've been talking about tonight. Well. Um 9-11, uh, at least from a layman's perspective, as we watched just the horrible, horrible destruction of what occurred on that day, um, what we, the layman often heard was, well, you know, one of the reasons that we let our guard down, that something like this was possible, was because our law enforcement agencies, federal, state, and local, we're just not talking to each other, communicating with one another, coordinating, sharing information. And I know laws have passed and many things have changed since then. Does that issue still keep you up at night? Do you think that we uh, are doing a terrific job of coordinating now and as a result are reducing the threat, or is there still work to be done amongst all those multi-level actors and agencies? Well, I'm, I'm impatient by nature, so there's always more work to be done. But I would say, and especially with the perspective of somebody who, as you said in your introduction, was in FBI headquarters on 9-11 and around for, at the heart of really a lot of the changes post 9-11, coming back into service now in this era, the the leaps and transformations that all of us collectively have made in that regard, I think are, are very encouraging and should make everyone feel better about the way in which government partners together, federal, state, local, those joint terrorism task forces I mentioned, uh, you know, back around the time of 9-11, there were only a handful. Now every field office, it's like 4,500 uh, investigators from federal, state, and local agencies all working together uh, there is a mindset of share, share, share. So I think that part has improved dramatically. I think what I would say that's more concerning in some ways is that the terrorist threat itself has also changed in a way that makes it more, more vexing and more challenging. So if you look at the kind of threat that we were focused on, on 9-11 certainly, and in the years right afterwards, you picture this sort of classic Al-Qaeda sleeper cell picture of the 19 people on 9-11, for example. Well, if you think about a threat like that, you've got a group of people communicating with each other, planning, training, fundraising even. Um, there are a lot of, you heard the expression of dots to connect. In that kind of situation, there are a lot of dots out there to connect all the interaction between them and all the work they're doing. 
What worries us now is what we call the homegrown violent extremists, which are people here, largely lone actors, inspired typically online, maybe radicalized by some jihadist movement like ISIS, or domestic violent extremists, much the same way, who don't have a lot of Confederates, are acting largely, like I said, alone, who choose to attack soft targets with crude, easily accessible weapons. And in that kind of situation, there are not a lot of dots out there. And on top of that, the time, as the professionals would say, from flash to bang is much tighter. So fewer dots to connect and less time in which to connect them. I mean, I don't have to tell anybody in this audience that it, it, how challenging it is to try to figure out who might want to decide all of a sudden, based on something they saw online, to just drive their car through a pedestrian walkway. So that kind of threat is what keeps us on the balls of our feet now. Yeah. Um, you know, the public often sees you in your role as the director of the FBI, perhaps a press conference here or there, called to testify in front of Congress. Um, and it seems in the last decade, um, the FBI is in the headlines, so much more so than used to be the case. And often it's, it seems there's politics that tries to pull the agency in, in one way, shape, or form into these headlines. And I wonder, how do you as a director, you're certainly not a politician, you're a civil servant, how do you keep the FBI in its lane and do your best to keep it out of the political back and forth? Well, as you can imagine, this is something that I think about a lot. Uh, the first thing I will say is that political controversies and even controversies specifically invest in, in impact in the FBI have been around for 113 years, uh, as your exhibit in some ways demonstrates. What has changed uh, is that we're now having all that play out against the backdrop of 24-7 cable coverage and more importantly, ubiquitous social media. Uh, you used to hear people say the Vietnam War was the first war fought in our living rooms, referring to television. I would say that the controversies we've had to deal with are the first ones in the environment that I just described. And I think we have to stay focused on the basics. And what I mean by that is we have to make sure we're focused on our core values, rigor, professionalism, objectivity, following the facts wherever they may lead, to ma no matter whom they may lead, no matter who likes it. And I add that last part because one of the things I've discovered in this day and age is with people so fixated on results is there's always going to be somebody who's unhappy with the arrest we made, the arrest we couldn't make, the intelligence assessment we made, the intelligence assessment we couldn't make, and they're going to second guess and criticize us. That just comes with the territory. We need to make sure that our process, the way we did our work, is bulletproof. Mm -hmm. And that's what I keep trying to preach to our people. If we do that, I think we'll be just fine. Uh, and as, uh, as it, to me, it's about focusing on the work, on the people we do the work with, and the people we do the work for. And what I see now, having been to all 56 of our field offices, most of them more than once, met with law enforcement partners from all 50 states, law enforcement and security partners from well over 50 countries, judges, business leaders, community leaders, prosecutors, victims and their families. The, the appreciation that I encounter for the FBI's 37,000 men and women from them, not on social media, but from them, uh, is inspiring. And as further testament to that, um, in 2019, the number of Americans all over this country applying to be special agents, to put their lives on the line working for us, tripled the pace that it had been for the last, I don't know how many years before that. And it continued in 20 and 21. It's the highest it's been in about a decade. And in my book, that speaks volumes about what people think of the FBI and what we want them to think about the FBI. Sure, yeah, that's good news. You know, other than 
those double, triple the number of people who say, I want to be part of that FBI family, as you just noted. Director Ray, how can the average person out there help in the FBI's mission? You know, you referenced importantly that particular example, the case with GE and the Chinese trying to steal technology for a jet fan blade or what have you, but is it the average businessman? I mean, do you have to be a head of a Fortune 500 to uh, assist the FBI by looking for espionage or what have you? What can the average person do to help other than enlist and work the, for the FBI? I think the, the engagement with the public, both citizens, individual citizens, businesses of all sizes alike, early engagement is the key. Uh, whether it's active shooters that we're trying to prevent or terrorist acts we're trying to prevent where someone we have found time and time again uh, who knows the person or observes something, says something to law enforcement. That's how we prevent those attacks. So that's early engagement. The private sector, I talked about that some in my remarks. Businesses of all sizes reaching out, letting us know what their needs and risks are, what they're seeing. On the cyber side, we need companies, and we are seeing more and more companies, to notify us quickly when they encounter intrusion. Uh, at the end of the day, engagement by each of us protects all of us. I wonder if you as direct, you talked about what we can do um, on behalf of the United States, certainly at the agency, to defend against incredibly destructive cyber attacks on the United States corporations, on our government, what have you, the theft of information. Are you, do you ever get frustrated that the United States, that our government is not proactively reacting to these kinds of acts by engaging in cyber attacks on those bad actors to either to prevent their action or to pay back for what they might have done? to shut down a, a pipeline in the United States, or that kind of thing? Well, what I would say is that we and our partners across the intelligence community um, and other agencies work very closely together to try to disrupt, say, the cyber threats, for example. Um, and a lot of what we and they do together is the kind of thing I can't discuss in a open setting like this, um, other than to reassure people that there are a lot of very impactful things that, that we do. Uh, in some instances, there are things that I can point to publicly where we have taken down the bad guys' infrastructure, you know, their cyber infrastructure, and some of that stuff does happen. The, the operation I mentioned in my remarks uh, related to the Microsoft Exchange uh, action is a place where we took action to disrupt an attack. Uh, so there are things like that that are happening, um, but what we don't do is compromise our values. We don't engage in indiscriminate hacking and gobbling up all their personal data. So there are a lot of things that some of these other countries do uh, that we won't do, and I think we're better for it. Hmm. About ransomware, you know, the average person turn on the television today and you'll see all sorts of advertising about how to protect your company or yourself. Is the problem really exploding around the world and uh, against American actors? Uh, because I, it certainly seems like the, the average citizen gets a sense that it's just out of control. There has certainly been a significant increase in ransomware. I think from 2019 to 2020, for example, I think the, uh, the overall volume of ransoms paid and of reported complaints, I think, tripled. And you mentioned in your introduction that we're currently investigating over 100 different variants of ransomware, but each of those has scores and scores of victims. And that's not counting all the other kinds of cyber attacks uh, that we investigate. Uh, one of the things about ransomware um, that is so striking is that some of the more recent examples have caused, I think, the average American to understand how it can affect them. It's no longer just, you know, company X who's 
lost access to its databases. Now it's affecting the price of gas at the pump, the availability of hamburgers, you know, and so suddenly people are starting to see how ransomware affects everybody. Would you say that uh, U.S. corporations, businesses in the United States, are they doing enough to cooperate, to work with the FBI, to work in partnerships to your satisfaction so that we can counter a number of these threats? Or does, does there still need to be a lot of education done with the American business community? Well, I think it's, it's moving in the right direction. Uh, I see more and more businesses all the time who are doing the right things. They're building relationships with their local FBI field offices. You know, there's that old saying that the best, best time to patch the roof is when the sun is shining. They're doing that more and more. Uh, more and more they're notifying us when they've had an intrusion. And more and more they're working with us after there's been an intrusion so we can help prevent the same thing from happening either to them again or to countless other companies. So it's going in the right direction. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm impatient by nature and I always think we can do better and we can do better and we need to do better. How about on the encryption front? You know, the, some of the fabulous software companies in the United States and uh, the ability they have to protect code, their software, to protect a client that purchases from them. Yet the, these encryption tools are just remarkable, and as you know, in terms of the difficulty to uh, defeat them if the agency needs to um, protect someone or something. Um, are you getting, in your mind, sufficient cooperation from the code developers and the Microsofts and others of the world that allow you to go through a back door to detect criminal activity, for example? So uh, it's a good question. This is a major public safety issue, and frankly, more and more, it's a national security issue. Uh, we are, of course, as a cybersecurity agency, which is part of our mission, we're big believers in encryption, and we're not asking for back doors into anybody's uh, infrastructure. But what we are asking is for companies to make sure that when they design their platforms, their devices, they preserve a way to respond to a warrant. And that's what's at stake here. We are heading in a direction, and it's important for people to understand this, we are rapidly heading in a direction where devices and messaging platforms will be constructed in a way where they are essentially warrant-proof. And what I mean by that is picture the most awful crime you can imagine, picture the most grave threat to national security you can imagine, Picture the most heartbreaking victims or numbers of victims, and then picture the most bulletproof, ironclad, rock-solid court order, and then process the fact that we will not be able to get access to the content to protect people. That will be beyond reach for law enforcement and national security agencies. And I hear about this issue from my state and local partners all the time, and I hear about it from my national security counterparts all the time. So we have to, as a country, find a way to work together to solve this issue, because otherwise we're going to wake up one day, and it's rapidly happening, where suddenly we can't protect people. Yeah, so in, re in relation to that, can you talk about cryptocurrencies? and where you see that going because again from a layman's perspective it just appears with these new monetary secret monetary exchange programs and blockchain and all the rest of this sophistication that this has to have given criminal elements bad actors in particular a safer way to hide from the law is that right well, certainly cryptocurrency makes it harder for us to follow the money, and following the money is a tried and true law enforcement, especially FBI uh, tactic, uh, as your exhibit demonstrates in, in numerous ways. We have developed more and more analytic techniques and tools, uh, and we try to stay ahead of the cryptocurrency advances, but it's no longer a problem just with sophisticated 
actors, we're seeing it more and more in less sophisticated criminals as well. And it's clearly the direction in which things are going. And there is a, a similarity between the cryptocurrency issue and the warrant proof encryption issue in the sense of blinding law enforcement in its ability with a proper legal process to keep people safe. Yeah. I got time for just two more questions, if you would. Um, January 6th, there's little doubt, and we see it on the news every day, that the FBI seems to be sparing no resources uh, to go after some bad actors uh, for the tragedy that occurred on January 6th, which is a very good thing. At the same time, I think there's also a concern out there in the community that uh, a lot of bad actors did similar things, whether it be to federal courthouses or police headquarters across the United States in the summer of, of 2020. And can you assure the American people that the FBI is working just as hard to give equal justice of law to, to those kinds of things that are happening there? I mean, absolutely. We have one standard, which is I don't care whether you're upset about an election, upset at our criminal justice system, whatever it is you're upset about, there's a right way and a wrong way to express your being upset in this country. And violence, violence against law enforcement, destruction of property is not it. That's what, I mean, that's what the rule of law is about. So we have, in both instances, opened hundreds of investigations, in both, related to the stuff over the summer and January 6th. We've made hundreds of arrests in both. Uh, we've used nearly all 56 of our field offices, including our joint terrorism task forces in both. Um, we've used investigative publicity, most wanted posters and things like that in both. There are some differences, though. In the January 6th instance, it happened in broad daylight and has been photographed extensively, people's faces eminently visible, uh, and involved the fairly unmistakable breach and entry into the Congress while they were in the middle of conducting one of their most sacred responsibilities. Contrast that from a lot of what we saw over the summer was happening under cover of darkness with people's faces concealed, often attacking buildings that might not be federal property, in some cases the courthouse, but not while people were in operation. And so the federal hook, the federal jurisdiction is sometimes a little different and the ability to prove it is more challenging. But we're still working those cases. In fact. Just, uh, just a couple months ago, I can remember a case in St. Louis where we indicted a guy for uh, arson of a gas station during the, the summer of 2020 uh, stretch. So we're pursuing both, we're aggressively pursuing both, uh, and as I said, we have one standard, which is you don't get to commit violence. Yeah, well said, Director. Last question, it deals with the sanctity of life. I, Again, if one was to turn on the TV last week, they'd see another and another and another policeman, law enforcement official killed in the line of duty, ambushed. This seems to be occurring with just a remarkable frequency. And I, uh, What's going on out there? What is happening in America today where law enforcement is being targeted like this when they should, police, federal law enforcement should be on the pedestal that it deserves? Well, not just federal law enforcement. I think an awful lot of the, in fact, the vast majority of these uh, heartbreaking line of duty deaths are our state and local brothers and sisters. Um, and they're the ones that are really bearing the brunt of it. Uh, and we need to be there for them. Uh, I will say this is one of these issues that um, does not get, in my view, the attention it deserves. We had 73 law enforcement officers feloniously killed in the line of duty last year. That's greater than any number since 9-11. Uh, and what's even more alarming is how many of them were unprovoked ambush or something similar type attacks. And of course, that's not even counting all those officers who were killed in other ways, 
or who were shot and wounded, but thankfully survived, but whose lives and his family's lives are forever changed. Uh, and we're off to a pretty grim start in 2022 as well. I, I wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal uh, a couple weeks ago trying to raise more attention to this issue. Uh, and one of the really grim things that struck me as I was working on the op-ed was that more kept dying as I was fine-tuning the piece. Um, and this hits close to home for us, as I mentioned to you when we were downstairs. You know, last year, the FBI had two of our agents, Daniel Alfin and Laura Schwarzenberger, who were shot and killed in Miami. And then we had a task force officer, a great task force officer named Greg Ferency, who was ambushed literally right outside one of our offices in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, and one of the things I started doing um, kind of right as I started as FBI director was I decided every time an officer was shot and killed in the line of duty in this country, I was going to call personally to the chief or the sheriff and express my condolences. And each time I have my staff put together a write-up on their family, how, how long they served, uh, a photograph, the circumstances. Um, and I've made well over 200 of those phone calls. And the thing that strikes me is that if you stop and think about what it takes for a person to be willing to sacrifice his or her life for a total stranger, that's a pretty special person. Not that many people are wired that way. And then if you think, how many people are willing to get up and do that every single day, day after day after day? Uh, it's extraordinary. And it is a, uh, in my view, a, a um, cherished resource that this country has that uh, we should be taking better care of. Um, and I think that means more resources, more training, more equipment for them. I think it means addressing the violent crime problem more head on and keeping the most dangerous offenders off the streets. Uh, and I think it means the community in lots of different ways showing officers how much they appreciate it and how we have their backs. Yeah, more support. Just a, a great way to end it. Director Ray, on behalf of everyone here, I, uh, we're just truly honored to have you come and, uh, and cannot thank you enough for spending an hour of time with us. Thanks so much. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.